Let's take our Bibles. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6. If you're visiting with us, you may look in the chair in front of you, the Bible in the chair in front of you. Uh, it should be most of the Bibles, uh, page 77 to 78, I believe, would be Leviticus. Some of those Bibles I believe are different, though. So I apologize for that. But I know for most of the Bibles we have underneath the chair, it's on page 77. Up to page 78 as well. Leviticus, we're going to start in chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 8. Uh, well, if you have another Bible, or if you have a MacArthur Study Bible, if you have that, you can look at that. Um, Leviticus chapter 6, I'm going to begin to read in verse 8, and then we're going to read to the end of chapter 7. Should take us approximately seven minutes and thirty seconds. <laughs> you know, and I'll say this again. This is so important for us to read this. God has this in His Word. So that's why I'm reading this. And when was the last time you ever heard that read in the service, right? No, I mean, I've never heard anything like that. So this is good. It gets us used to reading Scripture and gets us reading in. Uh, what is it? 39 books. So what's the percentage? Figure out the percentage. 39 books of 66. The percentage of that, that's our Old Testament. And we spend so much time in our New Testament. And yet it's still based upon the Old. Chapter 6, verse 8. And I will alternate like I have before between the Lord and Yahweh. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering itself shall remain on the, hearth, on the altar all night, to the morning. And the fire on the altar is to be kept burning on it. And the priest is to put on his linen robe. And he shall put on undergarments next to his flesh. And he shall take up the ashes to which the fire reduces the burnt offering on the altar and place them beside the altar. And he shall take off his garments and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out. But the priest shall burn the wood on it every morning. He shall lay out the burnt offering on it, and offer it up in smoke the fat portions of the peace offerings on it. Fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It is not to go out. Now this is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall present it before Yahweh in front of the altar. Then one shall lift up, excuse me, then one shall lift up from it a handful of the fine flour of the grain offering with its oil, and all the incense on the grain offering. He shall offer it up in smoke on the altar, a soothing aroma as its memorial offering to the Lord. What is left of it, Aaron and his sons, are to eat. It shall be eaten as unleavened cakes in a holy place. They are to eat it in the court of the tents of meeting. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their share from my offerings by fire. It is most holy, like the sin offering and the guilt offering. Every male among the sons of Aaron may eat it. It is a permanent ordinance throughout your generations, from the offerings by fire to the Lord. Whoever touches them shall become consecrated. Verse 19, when Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, This is the offering which Aaron and his sons are to present to the Lord on the day when he is anointed. The tenth of an ephah, a fine flour, as a regular grain offering, half of it in the morning, and half of it in the evening. It shall be prepared with oil on a griddle. When it is stirred, you shall bring it. You shall present the grain offering in baked pieces as a soothing aroma to the Lord. And the anointed priest will be in his place among his sons to offer it. By a permanent ordinance, it shall be entirely offered up in smoke to the Lord. So every grain offering of the priest shall be burned entirely. It shall not be eaten. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his son, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is slain, the sin offering shall be slain before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest who offers it for sin shall eat it. It shall be eaten in a holy place in the court of the tent of meeting. Anyone who touches its flesh shall become consecrated. And if its blood splashes on a garment in a holy place, you shall wash what was splashed on it. Also the earthenware vessel in which it was boiled shall be broken. If it was boiled in a bronze vessel, it shall be scoured and rinsed in water. Every male among the priests may eat of it. It is most holy. But no offering of which any of the blood is brought into the tent of meat to make atonement in a holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burned with fire. Chapter 7, verse 1. Now this is the law of the guilt offering. It is most holy. In the place where they slay the burnt offering, they are to slay the guilt offering, and he shall sprinkle his blood around on the altar. 
then you shall offer from it all its fat, the fat tail, the fat that covers the entrails, and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them, which is on the loins, and the lobe on the liver he shall remove with the kidneys. And the priest shall offer them up in smoke on the altar as an offering by fire to the Lord. It is a guilt offering. Every male among the priests may eat of it. It shall be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy. The guilt offering is like the sin offering. There is one law for them. The priest who makes atonement with it shall have it. Also the priest who presents any man's burnt offering, that priest shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering, offering which he has presented. Likewise, every grain offering that is bathed, bathed in the oven, and everything prepared in a pan or a griddle, shall belong to the priest who presents it. Every grain offering mixed with oil or dry shall belong to all the sons of Aaron, to all alike. Verse 11. Now, this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which shall be presented to the Lord. If, he's offered, if he offers it by way of thanksgiving, then along with the sacrifice of thanksgiving, he shall offer unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers spread with oil, and cakes of stirred fine flour mixed with oil. With the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving, he shall present his offering with cakes of leavened bread. And of this he shall present one of every offering as a contribution to the Lord. It shall belong to the priest who sprinkles the blood of the peace offerings. Verse 16. Now as for the flesh of the sacrifice of his thanksgiving peace offerings, it shall be eaten on the day of his offering. He shall not leave any of it over until morning. But if the, sacri if the sacrifice of his offering is a motive or a free will offering, it shall be eaten on the day that he offers his sacrifice, and on the next day what is left of it may be eaten. What is left over from the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day <coughs> excuse me, shall be burned with fire. So if, anyone, if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings should ever be eaten on the third day, he who offers it shall be accepted, not be accepted. It shall not be reckoned to his benefit. It shall be an offensive thing, and the person who eats of it shall bear his own iniquity. Verse 19. Also the flesh that such as anything unclean shall not be eaten. It shall be burned with fire. As for the other flesh, anyone who is clean may eat such flesh. But the person who eats the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which belongs to the Lord, in his uncleanness, that person shall be cut off from his people. And when anyone touches anything unclean, whether human uncleanness, or any unclean animal, or any unclean detestable thing, and eats of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which belong to the Lord, that person shall be cut off from his people. Verse 22. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall not eat any fat from an ox, a sheep, or a goat. Also the fat of an animal which dies, and the fat of an animal torn by a beast, may be put to any other use, but you must certainly not eat it. For eats the fat of an animal from which an offering by fire is offered to Yahweh, even the person who eats shall be cut off from his people. If you are not to eat any blood, either a bird or animal, in any of your dwellings, any person who eats any blood, even that person shall be cut off from his people. Verse 28. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, He who offers the sacrifice of his peace offerings to the Lord shall bring his offering to the Lord from the sacrifice of his peace offerings. His own hands are to bring offerings by fire to the Lord. He shall bring the fat with the breast, that the breast may be presented as a wave offering before the Lord. The priest shall offer up the fat and smoke on the altar, but the breast shall belong to Aaron and his sons. You shall give the right thigh to the priest as a contribution for the sacrifices of your peace offerings. The one among the sons of Aaron, who offers the blood of the peace offerings and the fat, the right thigh shall be his as his portion. I have taken the breast of the wave offering, and the thigh of the contribution from the sons of Israel, from the sacrifices of the peace offerings, and have given them to Aaron, the priest, and to his sons, as their due forever from the sons of Israel. This is that which is consecrated to Aaron, and that which is consecrated to his sons from the offerings by fire to the Lord. In that day when he presented them to serve as priests to the Lord, these the Lord had commanded to be given them from the sons of Israel in that day, in the day that he anointed them, as their due forever throughout their generations. Verse 37. This is the law of the burnt offering, the grain offering, and the sin offering, and the guilt offering, and the ordination offering, and the sacrifice of peace offerings, which Yahweh commanded Moses at Mount Sinai in the day that he commanded the sons of Israel to present their offerings to, uh, to Yahweh in the wilderness of Sinai. Let's pray. Guide my words. You know I need it. Open our minds. We know that we need it. Amen. 
a most strategic diplomat for the United States to the nation of France was Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, he secured a critical military alliance with France in 1778 and negotiated the Treaty of Paris in 1783 ending the American Revolution. Benjamin Franklin was strategic. As a matter of fact, France enjoyed him so much as a diplomat for the U.S. A diplomat is a person appointed by a national government to conduct official negotiations and maintain political, economic, and social relations with another country or countries. The short version, one appointed to represent a government in its relations with other governments. That's what a delegate would do. That's what an agent would do. That's what a representative would do. That's what a diplomat should do. He represents the government. That's why it's so important. So important for our diplomats and who they are, our as the United States today, and how they present themselves to the other countries of this world. Because they are representing our government. They are agents for our government. That's what a diplomat does. And you might say, why in the world are you bringing this up? <coughs> because Israel was God's agent on this earth. Israel was God's diplomat. Israel was God's representative. And even more specifically, the priesthood was representative of God's people. The priesthood was the agent of the holiness of God there to the people. And since they were representatives, holiness was mandated. Holiness was so important. Because remember, they had this tent of meeting. And that was the place where all the offerings were to be done. A place where God would meet with His people and He would do it by means of a consecrated, set-apart, holy priesthood. It was a symbol. This tent of meeting where they did all these sacrifices that we've spent the past, was three weeks on? Is our third week? Where they did all these sacrifices, this tent of meeting was a symbol of Emmanuel, which means kind of really God with us. It was a promise, and it was a reality that was there. So holiness mattered. And it was simply a replica. It was a replica of the heavenly temple of the heavenly tent of meeting. That's what the earthly one was. Except the earthly one, it was, it can be desecrated, and the one in heaven can never be desecrated. And all these offerings were done on one altar. One altar. Inside that tent of meeting, there was one altar that was there. There could be no other altars. Local shrines or local altars Israel would set these things up and the Lord said, don't do that. Why? Because he would be tempted to forsake the Lord. And plus it would assure that the priests would minister sacrifices. No effectual atonement would take place at an altar without the participation of a Levitical priest. None. No atonement was effected. Not at all. Without the altar... Without the tent of meeting, the covenant relationship with God and His people cannot be established and it cannot be maintained. So that was the only way God could dwell with His people. And it had to be holy. And this part that we come to in Leviticus has to do with these mandates. Specifically how I title this. Be holy for God is holy. Mandates to be agents of holiness. Commands this is how the Levitical priests, this is what they would get, this is what would happen with them. Most of this section was given to them. Most of this section that we read this morning was written for them. And that's what we're going to look at today. Mandates to the agents of holiness. And there's two questions that I have for you. Two questions in particular as we study through this. First question, question number one, why are these so important? 
mean, why would we spend uh, seven minutes and thirty seconds, approximately, <laughs> reading this? And why would God spend time writing this down? Uh, what's so important about this? Well, here's the first reason. Reason number one. They're simple. These things are so important because they're simple. There's no complexity to this. These sacrifices were simple, straightforward. You might say, I was getting all confused as to this and that, who's doing this and that and that. I'm confused. Yeah, you think you're confused with that? That's nothing in comparison to the rituals of their neighbors. The Canaanites, the Egyptians, the Hittites, what they had to do. I mean, this is just so simple and straightforward. There was no need to derive omens from the entrails of animals. You didn't need to do that. You didn't need to try and figure, oh, look, at his guts look like that. That's something bad. Oh, look, his guts look like this. That's something good. All right. You didn't have to try and figure that out. I mean, that's just plain crazy. Uh, let alone disgusting. <laughs> it was the last time you messed around with some animals. <laughs> So, that means it's so simple, straightforward. Another one. No human sacrifice. And that makes it nice, don't you think? No self-mutilation. That's what their name was also used to do. Uh, sexual or fertility rituals, they were absent. As a matter of fact, they were forbidden. We'll get to that later on. There was no sacrifices for the dead. No other weird things. Very simple. This was plain, my friends. The people needed forgiveness. That's it. The people needed atonement. That's it. Other reasons for sacrifices were brought as a response to God. Not to try and buy God out. I, I didn't need this. I'm trying, trying to try and buy this from you, God. No. It was simple. Everyone needed forgiveness, and then other people respond to God's goodness. The other thing, too, why this is so simple? Provision is made whether you're rich or whether you're poor. It didn't matter. There was no partiality with God. Both received just as much forgiveness as the other. What was expected of you was this. Get the best from your heart. God wants you. He doesn't want your money. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your life. That's what he wants. Mm -hmm. And that's what you were expected to give. Give the best. You're all from your heart. What was not expected was to impoverish yourself under a heavy religious burden. What was not expected that you impoverish yourself under this heavy religious burden or that you would enrich a powerful religious elite group, the priests. That was not expected. This was very simple, these mandates. This, this is why they're important. This is why they're in here. Here's another reason, too. Number two. It's direct. There's no secrecy. This was a big difference as well between Israel and the neighbors. The neighbors who practiced these secret rituals that were only for the priest's eyes only. Only for their eyes. Only for the priest to see. No, no. You're part of the you're part of the laity. You can't see that. This is for the clergy. You can see that. It's right out there in the open, right? No secrets, no secrecy. It's direct. And by the way, you find secrecy and that type of stuff in the cults and the occult, all these secret type rituals. Not with God. With God's rituals, they're right out there in the open. Right? That's why these are important. That's why these things are in here. Another reason, too, number three. Limited. There's no superiority. You might say, what do you mean by that? I mean this. The section that we've read limits the authority of the priesthood by spelling out their duties to prevent too much control over the people. They were not to take advantage of those whom they serve. Not to take advantage of them. 
And you know what? The New Testament picks up that principle as well. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3. Remember Peter speaking to the elders? He says, shepherd the flock of God. He didn't say shepherd your flock. He says, shepherd God's flock. And he says, not lording it over them. See, even the New Testament picks up on that theme. Where the, the authority of the priest is limited so that they don't have too much control over the people. But last, another reason why this is so important, not just simple, direct, limited, but also protect. No impurity. It was the priest's job to guard against any intrusion from impurity against the tent of meeting. From any impurity from approaching the tent of meeting. Getting even close to the tent of meeting. They provided shields to pre prevent, prevent the holy presence of Almighty God from breaking out against the sin in the camp. And then the people will perish. When we saw that in chapter 6, verse 18, the very last part of that verse, it says, whoever touches them shall become consecrated. Whoever touches the food becomes consecrated. You might say, well, so what? Why did you put that there? Because food for the priests, it would transmit the holiness. It would transmit the holiness to the people. And therefore, the people would be put at risk. Why? Because the people were sinful. And the priests were the ones who were representative of God and His people and holiness and righteousness. And they represented that. And if they touched that food, God's wrath could come out upon the people. That's why the Lord put those instructions in there. The priests were to protect. There should be no impurity. The people, unprotected with the holy anointed, were vulnerable to the Lord. And He could break out against them. Proximity to God like that could be very dangerous. So that's why these are important. That's the reason why. Now, what? The question what? We looked at why, simple, direct, limited, and protect. Now, what? What is its significance? What is it? What is it all about? I mean, uh, in other words, another way to say this, how does it apply to me today? You're a Christian here, sitting here, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what's, what does this all mean for me? Well, there's two parts to this. The first part I'm going to deal with is actually, to be honest with you, me. And the second part I'm going to deal with is all of us. Because the first part actually deals with me. For all ministers and pastors today. What is the significance for all ministers and pastors today? Now, mind you, pastors, me, guys like me, we are not, we are not we are not the agents of God. We are not the representatives of God. No, we're just simply the under-shepherds. You can think of me as a senior slave. Okay? That's what we are. But the significance for pastors and ministers today is this. Compensation. Portion. Chapter 6, 14 through 18. 6, 24. All the way to chapter 7, verse 14. Chapter 7, verse 28 through 36. Those sections, those are major sections in what we just read. And it has so much to do, this part in Leviticus has so much to do with what portion the priest would receive. What parts of the sacrifice they were entitled to. Particularly for the peace offering, the priest was provided generously. He was given the hide, the hide, the skin. It was very valuable. It was a generous provision for the priests. For the grain offering, it was for every male among the sons of Aaron, including their family. They got to be a part of that. They were not to eat the sin offering offered in their behalf, but they were to eat the sin offering of the others. It was their portion. No priest was excluded to prevent competition among the priests. Plus it would lessen rivalry as to those who would offer the sacrifices. And in chapter 7, verses 28 to 36, if you notice that uh, the thigh was presented as a wave offering, was the breast presented? The breast was presented as a wave offering, and they also gave the thigh to the priest as well. The wave offering, it was symbolic that they were presenting it to God and then receiving it back from Him. That's why they would do the wave offering of the breast. They were waving it, and it was like they were giving it to God and then receiving it back from Him. 
And by the way, too, that portion there that talks about the breast being given to the priest and also the thigh being given to the priest, those are pretty good parts of the, of the animal, right? <laughs> the good parts. And did you notice in chapter 6, verse 8, all the way to chapter 7, verse 21, that's written to the sons of Aaron. This is what you have. But then in chapter 7, verse 22, he says, now speak to the sons of Aaron. Uh, speak, speak to the sons of Israel. Why? Because the Lord wanted them to realize, hey, sons of Israel, need to realize this is the section that the priests are supposed to have. The Lord's servants were to be compensated for their service. It was both a privilege and an obligation. It was the material support of those who ministered to God's people. The tribe of Levi, Levi, they had no land. They had no other means by which they can receive support. None. And they were so dependent upon the people's faithfulness. So, those who serve God and His people as a primary occupation, as a supply, should be properly and generously paid and cared for. And my friends, members of First Southern, this is a great opportunity for me, and so I'm going to take it for me to thank you. For myself and for my family, you take care of us. We are taken care of. You compensate us. And we are appreciative of that. Can I say that to you? And can you know that this is coming? I haven't written in my notes, but it really is coming from my heart. How much I'm so thankful that you can take care of us. Thank you for compensating us. Thank you for letting us receive the portion. Thank you for letting us receive the breast and the thigh. So that's what applies to all ministers, pastors, guys like me. But what about to all of us? For all believers today, does this apply? Oh, absolutely. Because we are all priests. And remember I told you in the beginning, when I was talking about pastors, how we are not the agents, we are not the representatives, it's not us. It's us. Us together. All of us as Christians. We are all priests. We are the priesthood. That's why we read First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. For you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. That's who we are. We are God's agents in the world today. You are God's agents in the world today. That's who you are. That's who we are. And my friends, as agents in the world today, as priests, because we are God's agents, and now I'm going to be even more specific, not only are we agents in terms of the universal church, yes, but the local church as well. There must be something within the local church, so in the local church, in a local community. We are priests in this. We represent God in this. We are God's agents in this community here. And so because of God's, we're God's agents, what kind of priest should we be? What, what kind of priest should we be? What kind of priests are 